Good morning, everyone. We're really short on time, so I'm going to take a 45-minute presentation and reduce it to 20 minutes. So you get 10 minutes of, of Q&A. I'm in good hands here with Q&A. So just a few uh, details before we get started. Uh, the, on the left-hand side, I guess you can't see it, we're, um, I chair a, a merchant bank based in London that does uh, EU, UK technology, and also some energy cross-border advisory. But I also, uh, on the right-hand side, have a database, a proprietary database uh, on China built in 2008. Um, my database is focused on commercial, so we ignore all political and all military. Um, and I've tried to incorporate in my presentation today questions that came up yesterday. Um, I, uh, again, pick up, uh, we'll we try to shrink it so there's time for Q&A Q afterwards. Um, and for those of you that want copies of the slides, I'm happy for you to, to screenshot these, but I'm not going to release them. So when I usually speak, since I don't release, there's lots of cameras up with people taking pictures. I'm okay with that. I'm used to it. So very quickly, this is the original One Belt, One Road slide. On the right-hand corner is Xinhua, the official Chinese agency. And I just want to highlight two or three things on this why do I have 10.39? I should have 20 minutes. Someone, sorry, they gave me a wrong clock time. I'll do my own clock. Um, apologies. So um, it, it, the first thing to learn about China is history. And if you go back in time, the original Silk Road goes through S S Sri Lanka, which has a 2,000 year history with China, where the Romans used to trade through Sri Lanka, and also through Kenya, where China first landed in Kenya in 1414 and had three voyages to Kenya before Columbus ever discovered America. And of course, it ended in, in Venice. So as you see, in 2014, it was one belt, one road at the time. They then began building a series of economic corridors. There's six of those economic corridors built between 2013 and 2017. They start with uh, BCIM, which is Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar. That was built two months after it was first announced. Um, that's been restructured uh, in the last few months. There's now a special corridor between China and Myanmar. There's another corridor, I think, being developed and probably released today when they speak uh, today, uh, Modi and President Xi speak today, which would be India, Nepal, China. Next is CPEC, CICPEC in Southeast Asia, a land bridge we talk about a bit later. Um, the uh, Mongolia route, which is dry ports to the north on, on transportation. And then, of course, the, the one through, if you will, Central Asia, which we talk about again with, with uh, uh, rail routes. The reason I wanted to talk about this today is I, was, I did a, a mini version of this back in May in Shanghai. This is much more thorough. So. If you look at, the, uh, you heard the last couple of days about Yamal, and you've heard a bit about the liquid natural gas, which the next few pages will focus on. On the top is Yamal and Sabatis, which is what you've seen. Uh, when the ice flows are down, the route goes east, as you've heard, and then goes, is, pr is processed in Kamchatka. Yes, with flows into Japan, Korea, and China. Yes, and you can see the usage of LNG, uh, Japan and Korea, big users of LNG. Um, you also see, you know, the power of Siberia across the top as the, as the I'll speak of that second one, but that one's functional already. And you see on the right-hand side where, where Russia plans to go, if you will, from 11 million tons of LNG in 2016 to 140 million tons of LNG by 2035. I'll talk about that a bit more in a few more slides. Um, so what you also see on this is security. So once, the, once it's produced, once it's actually mined in, in Sabata and goes east, this, along the, the top, there's no risk of, Hanban, uh, of, if you will, of Hormuz, Malacca, or South China Sea. Secure passage, number one. Number two, the shipping times are less, and the reduction costs are less. So it's highly conceivable that Russia lowers its pricing on LNG and forces price competition with the existing players, including the United States and Australia and Qatar, which we come along on the next page. 
On the left-hand side, you see where the, where the ice, when the ice is there, you go west, possibly through Kirkenes, which we'll talk about in a second, or up to Zeebrugge. Um, and then you see a, a list, if you will, a couple of, of projects. I think Felix is here, was here yesterday talking about this. There is a rail route being discussed from Helsinki north to Kirkenes. Another rail route, if you will, a tunnel from Helsinki to Estonia. And of course, there'll be corresponding rail routes from that. So again, uh, across the top, when there's no ice, and to the west and down, if, when there, where there is, is ice. Now, this is how fast this is moving along. So you could see, you heard from Yamal yesterday that it started in fully functional. If you see all of these, they're currently functional. The first four are functional. Uh, many of these will be functional, planned by 2023. And you can see the offtakes here, involving many countries here. And you see again market share from Russia going from 2% in 2016, uh, ideally to get to 20% by 2035. This was in May, and here's, we'll show you some of the things that's happened since May already to show how fast this is evolving. This is LNG production exporter from 2018, and I've used numbers from Wood McKenzie. These are not my numbers. Uh, in fact, my numbers are slightly different from these, but these are actuals. But if we talk about actuals versus projections, because it's such high growth, um, the USA is thinking about going to 100 million by 2024. Australia also 100 million by 2024. Russia 63 million by 2024. But you might also look down that list on the left-hand side. Virtually all of the companies on the left-hand side are the members of the Belt and Road, signed members of the Belt and Road. So it's not just the ones I talked about before. It's also many of these other countries as part of the Belt and Road. And to give you some idea, this is not for this presentation today, but 20, in, 20, in 2016, 23% of China's outbound, or sorry, total trade was through the Belt and Road by, 29, by uh, uh, sorry, August, uh, August of this year, it was 29%. So 2% per year growth in BRI trade. So more and more of this will go and be redirected to Belt and Road countries. Again, these are actual numbers. Again, mine are slightly different. This uh, Wood McKenzie says basically 18 million for China and uh, sorry, in Russia in uh, 28, sorry, 2018, we have 27 million, but I've gone with the official numbers in case someone wants to run this and check it. I don't think you wanna see this slide, but, and I kept the slide from 2016, not from 2018 or 19, but the, the ice melt on the right says a lot. Um, and uh, the numbers on the left also say a lot. Um, and I don't want to get too dour about this, but fundamentally, um, the 2027 number is a Novacek number that they gave in June this year. Three years ago, that was next ex expected to be 2050 for the year of lack of ice. And two years ago, it was 2035. So they've now reduced it to 2027, which I think says a great deal. And the worst number on the page happens to be the, the last bullet point. Forget the 1.5 1, 1. Celsius rise in Siberia this year, it was 6%, which is quite frightening. So you saw, again, this, some of you saw this in May. What you didn't see in May were these. So the first, the first four of these all deal with the first uh, if you will, allocation. Sorry about the, the noise. The first allocation in, uh, if we will, in Novacek. So you see Total was the first with 10% stake. And then came two Chinese that did this early did it in April and May of this year. Um, they were going to do this later in the year, but there were competitors around the world, some of those sitting in this audience today. Um, and uh, the last done was done was uh, Japan. So again, it's, it's China, Japan, and ultimately Korea that have taken stakes in, in these, again, at, at a time of sanctions. Follow that, you then see Novacek CEO um, said that most of this they, they use will be produced for, for its friends along the Asia Pacific region. And you also see how Gazprom is allocating this all the way through China's uh, distribution. Um, 
And then sort of leaping, leaping ahead, uh, you see that India, and this probably will be announced officially today, it wasn't announced by Yamal yesterday, but India will be taking a stake either in LNG2 or what I call unofficially LNG1, which has, an official, has not been officially announced. It's also possible Saudi has a stake in this, but the next stake is India. Um, I might also, uh, somebody asked a question yesterday about sanctions. Um, apparently the, the Trump administration wants to apply sanctions to Costco and shipping. Um, unfortunately, he's a bit behind the game because basically with Mongolia playing ball with Russia and having a pipeline going through Mongolia, it really won't affect Costco shipping much. And again, the, the distribution is through friends, it, security, it's secured shipping, and again, pricing favorability me much closer to home. Arctic shipping routes basically uh, continue with the icebreaker fleets. The first one really shows probably some of you know already, which Russia has been in the game a long time since 1975. They have over 40 vessels doing this. But then look what's happened in the last few years. You've seen, if you will, a movement by Korea. Yes, its first move. Japan made another move uh, as well. There were 15 of those icebreakers being built. Three of those are in this number right here. Russia in 2018 um, had, it launched the service, its newest icebreaker, as you see. Sorry, there's too much words in the text. I don't like this, but I have to use it this way. Apologies. The next two in the middle are nuclear-powered icebreakers. And you see at the end where President Putin is committed to have 13 of these heavy-duty icebreakers, nine by nuclear reactors, powered by nuclear reactors by 2035. What's missing in this page is the United States, who currently has one and a half of these icebreakers. They're at least 30 years old, headed towards 40 years old. I think Senator Mikowski would know this, that uh, the Senate uh, apply, uh, approved $750 million to build an icebreaker, a new icebreaker, but the administration uh, had recycled that funding to build a border wall. That's as the source is Stars and Stripes, which is a military, U.S. military organization. So connecting now to other parts, uh, this is the European part, as you've seen, the eastern part. Um, again, Novacek West, if you go to Zeebrugge. A support, um, my friends from Kirkenes, if they're here today, will already know they're in discussions with Zeebrugge. And of course, you go across rail, across, um, if you will, Germany, and then ties into um, a rail line, at Baltic Rail, which we talk about a bit later. Uh, one of the key success stories of the Belt and Road so far in Europe is Duisburg. My family's from, uh, from Essen, just near Duisburg. And Duisburg um, has been a huge, um, uh, flow, if you will, of, of trains from China into Germany and a big connecting point from Germany south throughout Europe. And rail routes. So these are the three main rail routes, if you will. This was the fourth of the, the economic corridors. Um, and you see three main rail routes. The top rail route is the old uh, Russian, Russian rail. The center rail route is going through Kazakhstan with Horos as a gateway, and the Southern Rail Road through Iran, which isn't functional and won't be for some time for obvious reasons. However, you can go through Kazakhstan through BTK, which is through Azerbaijan, Tbilisi, uh, Ankara, and then up to the up to, to uh, the west part of, uh, of Europe. Um, I might also add on these railroads, what's not in here is what's happened in 2019. China has signed um, partnership agreements in Belt and Road with Italy with Switzerland, with Austria, and Croatia. So there will most likely be railroads connecting southern Europe across into Madrid, as well as infrastructure and logistics plays throughout Central and Eastern Europe. So much continues to happen. And to give you some idea of volume, in 2011, there were 15 crossings of rail. In 2017, there were 2,800. In 2018, there were 6,363. That's the, and, and when they first started going, it was eight to one going out versus coming back full. Now it's two to one. So again, there's, there's rail traffic coming from Europe 
back back into China. I'm well past my 10 minutes, so fortunately. Um, the la this gets really important. Just to show of hands, who knows about the SCO? Wow, we have a few. Normally it's none. So this was formed in 1992. And unlike the G7, which was a circus in Canada where my children are from, um, this actually works kind of pretty, pretty well as, a, as an organization. Their top priority is to try to eliminate or certainly decrease uh, terrorism in Afghanistan. And the, the reason for that is Afghanistan is very important for rail routes and cargo routes across, across Africa and sorry, across Asia into Europe. And you'll see all of these parties in here have signed the BRI except for India, which has not signed it and probably won't sign it now. But you see on the left-hand side some of the work that India is doing, and you see below they've all signed a way to digitize these routes, these, these projects. So currently there are 1,800 Belt and Road projects, and all these countries have signed a way to digitize these. Now today's not the right time for that conversation, but we're doing something tomorrow morning at half past 11, how this is being digitized both in the Far East, which would be Korea, Japan, and China, as well as uh, Asia and, and Europe, basically. Uh, and, and again, if you again, if it, what happens, I think, is going to happen in India today. If there is an India-Nepal-China um, agreement for a corridor, that will free up roughly 43,000 megawatts of hydropower in India, or sorry, Nepal, uh, and possibly that's, that's pre-snow melt. So uh, that, could greatly, uh, that could greatly help renewable energy, and again, what we've talked about before is LNG versus, uh, versus standard oil. And quickly, because again, timing. Sorry, I know I gotta go. I'll just leave these up. You can take pictures of this, we can talk about this page. There's no reason to actually talk about it. It's a billion eight people, a lot, sorry about that. A billion eight people, a lot closer, driven by LNG. And you can see the ways they're starting to work together, at least talk. So I need to move to, to questions again. Apologies, but we ran over and I gotta catch up. Thanks very much.